that's generally what I'll shop for. Like that's what gets me excited when I see a new knife coming out. If it's if it looks like it's going to slice well, if it's got a nice neutral handle, then that's probably the knife for me. And it leaves me with a lot of quite boring looking knives. But um, you find your differences in them, and you fuss over them in your own way, and you you see them all as your your own little knives, don't you? In the end. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkies. Welcome to another episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to episode 42 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. And great news to start the show, Bob. I think technical issues have been resolved on the knifechunky.com website. Indeed, those are in the past and that's where they will stay. So that's right. our, uh, so the podcast, you know, has been going up weekly on YouTube and on Facebook, but we were uh, we were wrestling with our hosting company uh, for our RSS feed and we finally uh, reigned victorious and uh, so the podcasts are going out on iTunes, Stitcher and all the other uh, all the other places you listen to your podcast. Yeah. And just to to clarify, they were still going out, they weren't getting out. But uh, they are in your uh, uh, your app, your favorite uh, player. I know I I use Stitcher. All the shows are there. So uh, if you if you missed them and didn't listen on iTunes or or join our Facebook group uh, where you can catch those shows, uh, they're in your uh, podcast player. So go back and uh, binge listen. We've had some good uh, good shows the past uh, two, three, four weeks that uh, yeah. folks need to catch up on. Yeah, we had uh, Nick Shabazz, we had Ian Pekarski, we had uh, Josh from Razor's Edge, we had Bob Terzuola. Uh, so some big interviews. So mm -hmm. yeah, make sure you you go back into your Stitcher menu or or uh, whatever you're listening to, uh, right? And uh, check those out. Yeah, another good one coming up today. But before we get into that, a uh, little bit of uh, knife news you want to talk about. But uh, first, some personal news. You got oh, a well, yeah. uh, got a new new blade, if you will. Yeah, well, I just uh, celebrated a birthday, and my brother sent me. Uh, my brother always sends really cool gifts. Uh, we we are. We Can are he be my brother? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we are of similar mind uh, and spirit, and uh, so he got me a World War One. Uh, it's a Spanish American War slash World War One era. Collins machete. Mm -hmm. And it's this uh, giant slab. It's about uh, 18 inches long, I'd say. But the blade is this giant uh, quarter inch slab of steel. Uh, and it pretty much remains a quarter inch all the way to the tip. And it's a full tang with giant wooden, I think it's walnut, uh, handles in a big um, canvas wrapped metal sheath. It, <laughs> it mm -hmm. is a serious piece of kit. Altogether, it's about three pounds. You can, I made a video of it yesterday. Right, it was my, yeah. my collection selection. And there I mentioned you could delimb just about anything. <laughs> uh, tree, human. Made, made for a man because as you said, the thing's got some heft. Yeah. It's, it, that's the thing that really shocked me. It's so heavy. And this, this was something that soldiers, uh, back in the World War One time would be carrying in addition to the rest of their kit. And nothing right. then was lightweight. They didn't have right. lightweight f fibers or, or, uh, you know, wicking uniforms. Right. right. 50, 60, 70 pounds of, of yeah. stuff. Yeah. 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 So this, uh, anyway, this is a very cool birthday gift. This Collins machete built for a real man, hearkening back to the times when, <laughs> right. when men were indeed men. And then, well, uh, well, also, well, let me, uh, well, let me, let me plug, plug the YouTube channel before you get oh, too yeah. far. Please. Uh, if you want to see, uh, the Collins machete review or any of Bob's new, uh, what he's calling, uh, knife collection selection videos that he's churning out on a regular basis, covering everything in his collection to give you a chance to, uh, to see it, go to the knifejunkie.com slash YouTube and you can catch all the videos. And if you want to go to the knifejunkie.com slash yt subscribe that'll get you subscribed to the knife junkies youtube channel so you don't miss anything so sorry for the interruption bob go ahead not at all that was that was the best kind of interruption <laughs> uh, but you'll see uh, so far i've posted at least one tops knives and uh one tops knife or tops knives knife and uh maybe you'll be seeing these next two in my collection sometime soon uh, i just wanted to announce or just say I'm excited about uh, the two new uh, Tops knives that are coming out just this week. One of them is the Devil's Claw. It's this, it's this small talon-shaped blade that they've been putting out for a long time, but they decided to put a, uh, elongate the handle slightly and put a, a karambit ring on the back, and it makes mm. a perfect karambit. So mm -hmm. th that's a cool little thing, the Devil's Claw karambit. And then they've had one that I've admired from afar for years. I've never gotten one called the Street Scalpel. Great name. It's a, <laughs> I love it's the a, names, yeah. It's a full-sized handle but small-bladed knife resembling a scalpel, I guess. 
and in a tactical sense. And they just came out with a new one, uh, re- sort of reconfiguring uh, the transition from the blade, from the handle into the blade, and gave it a little finger choil. I guess probably made it a little bit safer for thrusting. Um, or just uh, harder utility tasks, and it looks great. And it's a thick slab of metal, but somehow they they seem to get the blade down pretty uh, pretty thin. They step yeah. it in a little bit, and then they flat grind it. And uh, I don't know, it's just one I'm really excited about. And then since I'm on a little talking jag about knives, I want to buy the third and probably most imminent is uh, purchase is a Microtech Ultratech double edged. Mm. It's that's a Jim. That's an out the front um, automatic knife and had my eye on it for years, and I don't have any out the front aside from this $35 Chinese lightning that I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, so I think I might have an Ultratech soon. All right. Well, before we <laughs> uh, find out who the guest is uh, today, I want to remind you that uh, if you are like Bob and you constantly are shopping and buying knives, you may want to uh, make sure you sign up and get Ebates. It's free. You can get cash back for your knife purchases or really any purchase that you use online, as well as in stores. But since a lot of folks are doing online shopping, because you're a loyal Knife Junkie listener, if you're not already a member, you'll get $10 just for joining Ebates if you go to thenifejunkie.com slash cash back. Now, it's super simple, easy. I use the Ebates Chrome extension, so wherever I go, eBay or any other online merchant, Ebates will pop up and ask if I want to use their link and save some money. And I'm like, duh, yeah. So shop like you normally would. Get cash back. Go to thenifejunkie.com slash cash back. After you spend $25, you'll get $10 back. So again, thenifejunkie.com slash cash back. So Bob, what can we look forward to or listen forward to in the interview coming up? Well, uh, I spoke with Pete from the Cedric and Ada Gear and Outdoors channel on YouTube, and he's uh, he's one of my absolute favorite knife reviewers. He's uh, he's from Australia, and uh, he good is, day, mate. <laughs> and he is <laughs> oh boy, uh, yeah. And he has uh, a background in filmmaking, and it really shows in his mm. hilarious yet poignant videos. Mm. And they uh, not only does he uh, entertain with these videos, but his opinion I, I really uh, value because he spends the time with each knife and and uh, really you know figures out whether it's it's hype or if it's a really good working tool and he he does his own uh, knife testing steel mm. testing where he brings well we'll let him talk about it but uh, right. he's he's one of my favorites on YouTube and uh we had a great conversation and if you aren't familiar with him I'm sure after the interview it'll be one of your favorites too so let's get into it subscribe to the knife junkies YouTube channel at the knifejunkie.com/youtube Aside from, you know, really digging your videos and, you know, kind of watching everyone when they come out, I'm especially interested in talking to you about your, about the Knife Lab. Oh, yes. Uh, about, knife. about your steel testing. And, uh, and I, I heard you refer to it as bro science, which I, I think is, is a, a great term, but I think it might, uh, it might belittle what you do a little bit because you're, you seem to be very consistent. Not, not necessarily scientific. You know, you're not taking these steels to labs to test, but your process seems very consistent. Tell, how did that start? What, when did you become a steel nerd? Well, I guess my, my process is consistent, I suppose. My results are yeah, relatively consistent as well. Um, steel nerd, I would say. I think it, that's just the way my brain generally goes. I've got um, a bit of a numbers brain, and so I do like to be able to quantify things. And it was when I started seeing, you get into knives, and then you start seeing the same knife with sprint runs and, uh, you know, so you've got a, and it was the Ontario rat when that come out and you see the press that's saying, oh, the rat one is coming out in D2 now. So that's good for you guys who want longer edge retention. And my little numbers brain that wants to quantify these things, I was like, well, has anyone actually tested those next to each other? And I looked up on YouTube and there had been a few guys that have done this before. Um, there was a fellow called Blunt Truth For You. This is an old, old channel. Um, it's now not a, you can't even see it anymore. I think YouTube must have purged it or something. But he did a similar thing with cardboard. And I saw, well, he's done this with cardboard. I think he was showing um, SGPS, that Vulcan even uh, super steel. Oh. He's showing that next to next to the 440C or something. And he got a really decent, you know, it was, a, it was a tangible way of showing that, yeah, there is something to having a, you know, in quotes, better steel in your knife. And so I, th- I did that first test, um, Ontario Rat 1 in D2 versus Ontario Rat 
one in AUS8 and the D2, I think it cut twice as long with a roughly similar edge and all that stuff. And that sort of just set off this, um, well, if we can show that still was, you know, cuts for longer than that still, what else can we show? And it's changed a lot. It's changed, you know, how I've sharpened, um, I've initially, I think I initially did think I was a bit more scientific than I actually was. Um, and I've sort of tempered that over time. I think the safest way to approach it is that this is all just for fun and people can build their own meaning into it from there because it just kind of protects me from having really intense discussions with people sometimes as well. Because some, uh, I said in my most recent video, some folks literally will look at, oh, hey, Pete, you cut, you know, 14C28N versus VG10 and the 14C28N cut seven more times. So that still is better, isn't it? And I'm just really trying to avoid, so I've sort of scaled it back from that. I'm just really trying to avoid that level of intensity to it. So it's why I sort of have diluted it a little bit more often lately saying, uh, it's all a bit of bro science. It's all just a bit of fun, me having fun in my house, because in essence, that's exactly what it is. But um, I, I'm really happy with it as a body of work. I'm really, I'm really happy with, you know, this huge list I've got. And I've got this amazing yes. guy in, in America, Dave, and he's got obviously even more of a numbers brain than I do, because he's, he's more or less, he wasn't asking me to chart all my steals and I did this really I'm really bad with those sorts of things on computers and I did this really average looking list it was garbage just if where everything was and um, and he's come around with this this google sheet that um, you can still see at the bottom of all my videos and so Dave is the analyst out of the two of us as well so hmm. but um so yeah I'm, re I'm really happy with it as a body of work and sort of happier with it as just when I do a knife review I can then sort of say hey, this still, in the past, and in my sort of rope testing, it's done this. So I have this opinion of this still because of that, rather than just having a less tangible, anecdotal, you know, I feel like this still lasts longer just because. So it helps me in my reviews as well. I, I'm a firm believer that two things that are, uh, that are opposite can be true at once, or Anyway, two opposing ideas can be true at once. And on one hand, it's saying you're not sending it to a lab and it's not super scientific, but that doesn't really play much into it anyway, because we're talking about a tool that does a practical chore. Mm. And so if you're doing a practical um, experiment, you know, I think the results are, are, are just as valid. They might be anecdotal, but they're just as valid as sending it off to a, you know, a, a steel lab. I've been collecting knives for a long time, but only really aware of steel for the last 10 years. You yeah. know, it's like whatever came on it, as long as it looked cool, because yeah. I don't live a, a real high speed, low drag lifestyle, you know, <laughs> for sure. if it looks cool, I'm, I'm down. But I, I've gotten sucked up into the heady winds of, of this alphanumeric, you know, yeah. M390, M390 just has such a nice ring, but I will never, I've never push it to its limit, you know? Yeah. Well, it's, and it's the companies that have done that as well. They've started kind of branding steels just as much as they're branding their knives. And it's, a, it's, so it's been a re real cyclical thing. So the more the companies talk about steels, the more the consumers, like any enthusiast community, we're all intense with our interests, aren't we? So it just gives us more to feed off of and it becomes this kind of self-perpetuating thing. And I mean, I don't know what they'll be, I'm not sure what they're going to be talking about next. So it's been steals for a good 10 years that people have been sort of um, fussing over and looking at the next iterations. But you even see it with smaller things like, you know, you get the ceramic bearings people versus the steel bearings people. And we love these minutiae that the companies kind of give us to fuss over. Like if they just put in their ads that this blade is made of, you know, uh, stainless steel and it's on... Uh, a washer system if they gave us much less information and it, it'd, be, it'd be a lot harder for us all to dissect it as much so i think it's very much right. caused by the industry but then the nature of the internet at the moment is just that people can grab these little things and just go running away with them um, and mm -hmm. i think it's it's i'm not sure what the end game of this is going to be i'm not sure when everyone's going to get sick of this and move on to the next thing if that's going to happen at all but yeah right now it is definitely at fever peak isn't it it's crazy. Uh, people love their teams, you know, no matter what, what that team is. And, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of people on these steel teams now. And I, I want to know who is the person out there and what the hell are they doing when they have to resharpen M390? I got to say, you know, I got a bunch of it, uh, in my little, little case over there yep. and it, and it cuts those errant threads off my collar, you know, yeah. well, wickedly. He, and here's the thing. I had to facilitate me doing a rope cut test for me to really be able to, quantify these differences so it's um it's exactly that you're exactly right um most of us are just going to use and enjoy a knife we may in the back of our mind think to ourselves gee i feel like i've sharpened this knife less over the six months i've had it or i feel like i've sharpened this knife more but as a real end user that is the experience i think for most of us um there are some guys out there who cut carpet 
with their pocket knives. I'm sure of it. Yeah. There's guys who yep. work in the box factory, um, unboxing boxes and boxing more boxes, all that sort of good stuff for sure. But <laughs> yeah. I think they're in the minority a little bit. Like, as I said, yeah, I had to make a test because I wasn't doing enough to be able to say adequately that I could, you know, I needed to say when I did a rope cut, says this cut more than this. It wasn't occurring to me naturally. So yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, um, Rob Bixby at Apostle P put up an interesting video yesterday. I was right? going to ask you about it. And he used this term. He used this term, um, mental masturbation. And he's, he's mm-hmm. somewhat right about it all. And I don't see a shame. <laughs> Not that, you know, it's something that should be shameful or anything like that. Right. And we're talking about mental masturbation here. Um, well, but, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> Not that we should be ashamed of anything that occurs to us to do with our bodies. But anyway. Um, Agreed. <laughs> uh, it's somewhat correct. There was a lot in that video, a lot to unpack. And, um, yes. But really, it was um, very much so that we are going to have to do these big, long tests to be able to figure out the differences between these steels rather than just, you know, I've opened these and I've been opening envelopes with my knife for two weeks and this steel has dulled because that isn't really many people's lived experience. So. Yeah, that was right. just one takeaway I took from that video um, before the comments got turned off. And <laughs> got, yes, yes, yes. We've got this real intensity to it. This is what's. This is what I'm sort of a bit out of step with. I haven't really been up to speed with the HRC stuff that's been going on lately. Um, with the what? I'm sorry. There's the Rockwell testing stuff that's going on lately. Yeah. The other guys yeah, are yeah. doing, and I have. I've, I've really stayed out of it because. For a start, I don't know anything about Rockwell testing particularly. I've got a rough knowledge of the correlation between it and edge retention, but Mm -hmm. it's got really intense with just the, not vitriol, but like um, a lot of just, everyone seems to be after a bit of a gotcha moment or after a bit of a, um, yeah, so I've sort of, I've- Scandal, something to make it interesting and fun again. It's a bit like that, isn't it? It's it's like the Benchmade cutting up guns, things died down. So we're after, there's, there's like this undercurrent of people who are just, cause I've got all these DMs on my Instagram thing saying, Hey, Rob talked about Sissel rope in his, at the end of his video yeah. and well, you should do a video about it. And I'm just thinking, I think all that's going to give everyone is a, it's just going to perpetuate this a bit more and everyone's going to have another. And it's like, that, this isn't why I'm into knives. This isn't the fun part of the, of the knives to me. So I think that's, um, it's an interesting undercurrent right now. It's just this, it's, I'm not sure if it's anger, but it's it's everyone wants to be yeah catching someone out or getting that new getting that new bit of gossip or something. And it's a, yeah, I kind of just like to cut my rope in my shed and and do my very <laughs> non-committal sort of hey, this is just my fun testing, yay! But it almost seems like that's not enough for folks at the moment. But well, I guess we'll just see how it all pans out because I think in in its purest form, it's a really admirable thing that they're doing. We always use car analogies, don't we? Because I I guess that's a pretty understandable thing to have run but i guess it's that whole thing if you're buying a a car that's supposedly got an excellent engine even though you're only ever mm-hmm. going to go 45 miles an hour tops in that engine you want to know that it can do what it says on the box i guess right so it's really it's you want to ad- feel like you've been had yeah it's an admir- it's an admirable thing to pursue that these companies who are they're giving us these super steels they should quite rightly be putting it and presenting it to us in a way that is super so say if you're giving us k390 so i've got a spider co police here on the table Spyderco does this K390 at about 64 Rockwell. It presents it to us at, you know, a relatively thin behind the edge grind. I think it's 20,000th or something like that. It's fine. So it's a good presentation of the K390, right? But if they put this on a sharpened pry bar with a 25 degree per side edge, really fat behind it, the K390 is not going to, it may as well have been 154 cm or something, just a more, a more, you know, less exotic steel. And then the knife could have been cheaper and all that. So in a sense, it's definitely pursuing that, but it's just the, um, mm-hmm. the nature of the internet, though, it just gets really out of hand really quickly with the memes and with the, with the intensity to it. And it's just something I've kind of stepped a little bit back from, but, um, it's been very interesting to see. And that, <laughs> that poor old Rob had to, yeah, to turn the comments off on his video, I think. <laughs> but then you, you put yourself out there and that's what happens as well. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's yeah. Exactly yeah. the thing. It's kind of probably why I haven't really made like a direct address to it because I, for a start, yeah, I don't have the knowledge to be able to, I, I saw the Ferrum Forge guys, you had them on recently. Yeah. They did a video yeah. about it that seemed to get mixed responses. It's the sort mm-hmm. of thing, no matter what you say, People, you're going to get a really mixed response and you're going to end up in yeah. an argument. And so I guess I'm just saying to everyone, I don't know much about it to have an opinion. So I probably can't contribute to this discussion too much more than just saying, ah, maybe it's just for everyone relax a bit. Yeah, relax. And these are my findings. And it's, it's yeah. really, it's not that important. It's important because it's important to us because we get, you know, satisfaction out of it. It yeah. makes our lives more interesting and fun. But really, yeah, for sure. you know, uh, one thing he said about that. Uh, in that video that 
uh, that really resonated with me was when he says, you know, these are experts at what they do, you know, uh, knife companies, mm. they've been manufacturing knives for a long time. It's probably their intention to stay in business and probably not their intention to hoodwink anyone. Mm. Uh, you know, there are mistakes. Uh, there was that hootenanny thing a couple of years ago where people thought they were getting S30V and it ended up being uh, some kind of yeah. carbon steel. But really, you know, I, I experienced this in my in my work life. I, I produce television stuff and it's not infrequent that you meet a client who thinks they're a producer. And I'm like, you know, I, I don't do what you do mm. and you don't do what I do. Um, so you can have uh, guidance and vision and opinion, but, you know, kind of let me do what I'm going to do. And if I make a mistake, I'm not trying to screw you over. I made a mistake. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's funny what – and this is why I really try and get ahead of myself. And it's why I'm always telling everyone I'm, I'm really not an expert or I'm just doing my certain thing at home. I don't know the full story. I don't even know the full story of – Rob, even Rob seemed to – he sort of suggested he knew a bit more. I, I don't know. Um, I'm mm. not sure of the full story, but um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, just interesting to see um, yeah, just how far people will sort of carry it as well. I'm just interested to see like what the end stage of this is like, because I think the guys now are doing um, they think they're raising some money and doing some uh, catcher testing, and that is, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. that's a pretty well regarded. For, I'd probably regard catcher testing better than my sysol testing if you're after. Flat, flat science. It gives you very definitive numbers. So, is that that thing with the little wire that you cut? Uh, no, it's like that, a, it's uh, a, the knife blade is sort of held uh, and it cuts mm -hmm. through cards, like some card stock, and it's the same card oh. stock. It's all very controlled. So, right. I think their intentions are really good. They're 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 raising some cash to go out and do some catcher testing. So, I think they're after. I think again, what they're sort of saying is, uh you know, these steels should be given to us in a way that they act like the super steels that they are, and they totally get that as well. So. Yeah, I'm just I'm very interested to see like where it all goes and what the end end result is for sure. Because um, yeah, I certainly won't be making a video on it though. Because I'll just end up with my bloody thumb in my ass, not knowing quite what to you know quite what I, yeah. I won't have the full story. And one one half that has half the full story, and the other half that has the other half, will all be in the comments yeah. all arguing with each other. And I just think <laughs> like we this is our leisure time, isn't it, people? Like this is what we're doing to have fun and to to unwind when we're not at our you know jobs, you know, right. when our noses aren't against the grindstone. It just you know, let's, let's do it in a fun way, at least. That's kind of what I'm thinking. I can never help but think uh, when um, something like this comes up, you know, there's some scandal in the yeah, knife yeah. world. Uh, and and, and uh, people start taking it real seriously. Mm. I think uh, I, I impose my own thoughts on it, which is uh, sometimes I catch myself, you know, falling asleep thinking about my collection. Yeah. I'm like, dude, that is not what you want to be doing. Like, <laughs> yes, you know. It's it's good to manage your collection, but I mean, like when something really important happens, and usually something really important is bad. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. when something bad happens, all of these thoughts will be so long gone, yep. and if they're not long gone, I will be regretting yeah. spending all that time and the energy. And energy. It's just you don't you don't get that back, you know. And all exactly. the, the only thing I'd sort of leave it on is that the entire supply chain, from the person who designs the knife to the company that makes it, to the shop that sells it to the users that that comes and does the testing. And this is applicable to everyone on both sides is that I think everyone is just trying their best and everyone's, everyone is working, I think, in good faith. Um, I don't think there's too many sharks in the larger production industry. You hear about the dodgy odd company that says it's made somewhere that's not, all that sort of stuff. But yeah. I think in real terms, like whether it's the, the guy who's doing his testing thinking he's doing the right thing, he means well. Uh, but then, mm -hmm. so, does, then so does the customer service person who you talk to when you send them the Instagram comment, they mean well as well. They just want to do their job. I had a very humbling experience last year when I did one of my tests on a steel wheel knife. And this kind of put a lot of it into perspective for me. Um, still, yeah, it was steel wheel. I get steel wheel and real steel confused all the time, but yeah. it was a steel <laughs> wheel knife. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> Shit. And, um, and I, I got a weird result with it on the rope and I, I did do a pretty thorough test on it. But in my opinion, in hindsight, I was too... I, I did that whole thing and I, you know what I, I felt like? You know when you – have you worked in retail? Yes. And you get those people who take it out on you at the front line and their, prob <laughs> their problem is with the organization eight levels mm -hmm. above you. But you're at the counter and you're getting the Karen who's walked in with that short haircut. He wants to talk to the manager and she's, she's gone. And I felt like I was being – in hindsight, I felt like I was being that person a bit because I sort of I, – I took the – you know these these guys who work for their social media at these companies they they just they just be like a, a clerk or an admin person you know like it's and so and I sort of think ah oh, I was too intense I was too um, <laughs> I was probably too um, too quick to you know think that I'd got them and 
I think in hindsight, yeah, I think there was a problem with that knife. They fixed it. It was just ended up being like a warranty thing or whatever. And I always regretted that. And I just, it's the only caution I'd give to everyone is that you, these are real people at every step of this chain. And, you know, you feel like you're in the right, but everyone else is, I honestly think most people are just trying their hardest to just do their best when they come to work and do their eight hours. And it's just something that I'd sort of hope that everyone operates with that in their minds because that's certainly how yeah. I try yeah. to operate <laughs> lately. I, I agree with you uh, 100%. Sorry to interrupt you, no, but no, it's like if, if you're going to try and bulk people out of money, there are way better industries to do that in. Oh, exactly. You know, why go into the knife industry yeah. if you're going to try and like, you know, make millions of dirty, yeah, you know, exactly. filthy lucre. Yeah. So when, Pete, when did you get into knives? Have you always been a knife guy? Is this? Uh, I had, um, no, I was a massive, um, anime nerd, which I still am, um, a massive video game nerd, which I, I would be if I had more time. Um, right. But it was really just – and I was saying this the other day. I can't remember in what forum, but I was at that stage where I've, I've had little – I've got little kids at home. I've got a bit of – you know that free time you have – you got kids? Yes. You know that free time you have that's not really free time and your kids are really small? Yeah. You, you know, you don't – they're still at your house, but they're kind of just doing not much for the whole day. So, I had that yeah. kind of free time. So, mm -hmm. not where I could sink like 20 hours into a video game, not where I could sort of go out and do anything of, you know, particular substance. So, I kind of just ended up collecting things and, and I was doing a few odd jobs around my house. And so, it would be, it'd be probably in the last eight years or something, I would say. I was living rurally. I was starting to use, just from practicality's sake, I was using fixed blades and, and axes. I sort of started out as a bit of an axe and multi-tool kind of channel even when I think back on my channel. But... um yeah, I, it was out of necessity, and then I moved away from that rural setting, but I still had the, I developed the love for the sharp things, and I've mm -hmm. always been a bit creative. It was, yeah, I was, I was never surprised that I ended up making YouTube videos. I've always made stuff. Um, I've always was like a drama student at school and all that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. when the, it's funny when I look back on it, when my, whenever my interest in knives has actually decreased, my interest in the making the videos has increased to meet it. So the two things have, perpetuated and cycled around each other keeping me in the knife game very much so um so sometimes you'll probably notice on my channel i'll make videos that probably aren't as knife centric or they're the more, more odd off the wall videos they're just as important to sort of even though they're not even about knives sometimes they keep me in the game of making videos which will eventually mm -hmm. bring me back to knives it's a funny yep. it's a being a knife youtuber is it's a weird way of experiencing the knife hobby that's for sure and i think mark Knife Bro would say the same thing. I think it's it's um it's a mixing of two interests really that makes kind of one larger one. It's kind of developed into that. It's very strange. Very strange. Yeah, uh, we were talking right before uh, before we rolled that uh, you and uh, Advanced Knife Bro are to me kindred spirits, and and you you sit on the same shelf in my YouTube universe, mm. and it's humor and it's and it's filmmaking. He is a filmmaker by training, and it really shows in his work. Yeah, it's his beautiful. stuff's amazing, isn't it? And and you can tell that now. Now that you say that you are a, a, a drama student, mm. it it all it, it yeah. all makes sense. It's just that stupid, yeah. That um, just that need to put something extra in that just to, and it's probably just it goes back to the old days when you're when you're doing a play or you're doing like improv or something like that, and you just want to do that little flourish that gets you the big laugh, and it's still that <laughs> translating into my dumb videos because. I, I do try and make videos that I like. I think about the channels that I never miss a video of, and I think, well, I want to make videos like them. And so the channels, I, I will never miss an advanced knife bro video. I'll never miss a Dutch bushcraft knives video because no matter what they're reviewing, I know they're going to present it in a way that's that's going to have some flair. It's going to be probably funny. It's going to have some good shots and stuff. Whereas the other channels, there's a lot of channels that I love, but say I won't watch a watch review because I'm just not into watches. But mm -hmm. if Mark at Ni Advanced Knife Bro review to watch, I would watch that review because right. that would get me over that line. So, um, and those are the kind of videos that I try to make. I don't think I'm as sharp with my writing because I don't really write. I don't have a process. I do kind of just stream of consciousness my videos. Mark actually writes his videos. So, that's why they're so like crisp and, and mm -hmm. sort of consistently funny. Mine are a bit more slapdash, I think. But, um, and the Dutch Bushcraft guys, they do proper productions they just do one single weekly video though so you can see where they use their time whereas i'll kind of just trickle out whatever nonsense i'm sort of working on at the time and kind of just falls out of my channel whereas yeah those guys mickey and martin just they they do a thursday event video and that's 
that have obviously found themselves comfortable with. You mentioned how uh, one interest feeds another mm. and uh, kind of back and forth. And I, I, um, I find that with a lot of creative people that I've known and, and myself included. Uh, I need various uh, irons in the fire at once to, to keep interest in any of them because, mm. you know, I've got this... I mean, I do have an attention span, but sometimes I need to, to totally change the channel yep. to, to get myself going. And you had a period of that. I remember uh, seeing a video of yours maybe a year and a half ago where you, uh, I guess you were getting a little sick and tired of it for a while mm. or just, just feel, feeling the well run dry. Yeah. And then you came back and kind of explained yourself. Yep. Uh, not, to, not that it's anyone's business, no, but no. you came back and yeah, yeah. you have fans, so you you feel responsible, I'm sure. A little bit, yeah, for sure. I would imagine it was some of that creative filmmaking aspect of it or just, uh, you know, yeah, being dramatic was, that helped you come back. It was a combination of, and I think that fatigue was actually caused by a part of my channel that isn't knife related. Um, I had the misfortune of, and this is what everyone seems to want the big viral hit. I had the misfortune of a decently sized video kind of taking off, and it was about my bloody cat Basil, of all things. And <laughs> so all of a sudden on my channel, because, you know, if you're a YouTube guy, you have your creator app. It's one of those things you just find yourself checking too much throughout the day. And so I had this video about Basil really take off. It got to 300,000 views or something within a couple of weeks. And it just went stupid. And so I had all these bloody cat people in my comments. And cat people, are, if you think there's toxic elements to the knife community, the cat community is just insane. Like, it was full on. Like, I, I was, I shouldn't have bought a cat. I should have rescued a cat. I shouldn't have bought a oh, bread geez. cat. All of these things that I, all these mortal sins you I did. You feed your realize. cat too much. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I was committing all these mortal sins. And, and it's funny, like, you try and be thick skinned, and I'm getting better with being thick skinned with the comments and all that sort of stuff. It's a matter of just over time, you build up this resilience. Talk to Slicey Dicey about it. He's been reviewing for 20 years. He doesn't care what you say to him. I'm still getting there. Um, but, um, <laughs> It's it one of those things. Every time I check my app, there was this. I'd have to. I'd end up arguing with some dickhead about my you know, feeding my cat too much. So it was a bit of that going on as well. A bit of knife fatigue. Because I tell you what, as much as the steel test interests me, that's a lot. It's a it's a repetitive task, and so that mm, burns yeah. you out just a little bit as well. But then I think my response to that was, I yeah, I jumped straight into like film student mode. And I made these, you've, have you seen my Spyderco Advocate review that just went on and it was just this insanity. Um, it was all just this edited mashup of just nonsense. I've just, I've just republished it, not to plug myself too badly, but oh, yeah. just republished it as Advocate Accursed Film. The, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The joke was that Nick Shabazz sends me this Spyderco Advocate and my thought was, I'm just going to do this insane review on it and I hope someone at Spyderco sees it and just, and it just makes them feel strange for a day. Like that was kind of that was my goal with this with this video. And um, so I made this, and it was really cathartic. And lots of people who watch my channel just had no interest in it, and that was totally fine. But it felt so good to make, and I got all my buddies from the all the other reviewer buddies. And Nick did some Nick Shabazz did some voiceovers. Um, Advanced Knife Bro did a little bit in it, and it was just this good collaboration yeah. of these ridiculous videos that mean nothing, and they're just it's just this. A stream of consciousness, every odd little weird gag I could think of doing. It ends up being about a half an hour film if you watch it start to finish. But anyway, so that was pretty much like as much as people deride when I do do the odd stuff, I think it, they get a lot more thumbs downs and a lot more negative comments. You get the guy in the comment, if you're going to start making videos like this, I'm out. Yeah, I don't unsubscribe. Yeah. As, as much okay, as people. See ya. <laughs> yeah, and it's a bit like that because I think if it wasn't for those videos, I may have sort of pulled the pin or even just mm -hmm. backed off for a lot longer. So, yeah, it was good to tap into that stupid film school side of me or that, um, you know, that, you know, I'm doing air quotes. I know you can't see it because it's a podcast, that artistic side and just make something right. completely baffling. And it, it got like 5% of the views that most of my videos get. And it was, it was, <laughs> wasn't made for that. It was just a completely selfish piece made for me. And, um, right. that really, and me doing that or me doing like a, Sometimes I'll just go um, and just do like a really random specific joke in like one of my knife lab intros or something like that. It's that stuff that keeps me excited for, for making videos. So uh, yeah. you get a lot of folks who just like, I just want the, please just review the knife. I want to know how long the knife is. I want to know how much the steel cuts. You get those folks all the time, but they don't realize that, sorry guys, but, <laughs> to get that, you also need to yeah. put up with my bullshit as well. Uh, my favorite of your recent videos, uh, I mean, the one that, I mean, I was belly laughing. It was the 8010 video, that oh, whole yes. opening with the tool. I was pretty uh, proud of that one. 
It was, and the um, screaming. Yeah. Oh, my God. It was that jumping, was hilarious. Usually by the time I've j- jumped into like an online gag, it's probably been off of Reddit or Instagram for a couple of weeks. But I like to keep a toe in the meme stream of what's going on. And that was kind of a bit of a – you've seen the Kyle stuff, the Kyle memes. There's a – there's mm-hmm. a, the meme is at the moment, If you know, uh, probably about two months ago now when it was cool. The meme was guys like – guys called Kyle do this. It's just as the – some guys <laughs> chosen a random thing. If you're called Kyle, you do this. And it was kind of a bit of a reaction to all that. So I do try and keep somewhat relevant, but I know it's like cringy dad trying to keep up with it. I'm sure a teenage would think I was so out of date already, but it's that cringy dad level of trying to keep up with, hey, kids, you know, hey, fellow children, you, you think this is funny? So it's me doing that, and it seems to get a good response, so I keep making them. But, um, and it's funny, I think I just got the knife, and I was going to do a my, – my running gag with Cold Steel is I play the um, the Manly Man song, and I do like a funny intro like that. And I sort of was, I was going to do something like that, and then I thought, no, I think I'm going to run with this Kyle stuff. And I went and got a can of Monster from the from the service station, and yeah. Oh, that's what it I was. I just yeah, went with yeah. it, and um, – and yeah, the video has done quite well. It's I actually looked at the um, I looked at the AdSense revenue, right? And it's actually paid for that can of Monster I bought to shoot the video. So hey, pretty cool, there you huh? Go. Yes, <laughs> yeah, not bad. Full circle. It's starting to roll yeah, in. Yeah, exactly. I'll be yeah, I'll be having two monsters for my next video. You never know. This right. So another thing I want to ask you about, it, and this was in um in you know the three recent short videos of the knives that Stasa twenty three yeah, yeah. sent you. The best tech Tercel, which is weird to name a knife after a Toyota, but, um, okay. It's, it's a question that percolated and I've asked other people this mm. and, and, um, because it's something I think about myself. Uh, I've been collecting a long time and I have knives that I don't even think about carrying anymore. Mm. I'm like, geez, I can't, that's so out of date, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. but really it's still just made out of steel and yeah, G10 yeah. and titanium or whatever. Yep. Um, and y- your uh, review of the best tech, you kind of touch on that. You're like, this This is kind of like knife circa 2013, you know? Yeah. Where, so do you think that knives can go out of date? Like, can a hammer go out of date? I think there'll be trends. And I think there'll be things that the industry picks up that we want. And there's, and so the industry will respond. And there's a smaller YouTuber called uh, Nero, Vinny Nero, who said this much better than probably I'm about to say it. And he basically says that when we make a big deal out of things on the community, then the industry will pick up on that a little bit slower and then they'll make a version of that for us because they say, they'll say, hey, you kids like this, we've made more of this. We heard you yeah. kids like blank, here is more blank. And so I think back 2013, you were getting those first few really well produced Chinese knives. You get those, you got that custom level action for 200 bucks. And that was what people were making a big deal of. You'd watch all the old reviews and the person would go on and on about, you know, the, the drop shutty action and all that sort of stuff. So mm-hmm. I think, yeah, that knife is a bit of a knife representing that time. And it's an interesting thought because I believe now, and geez, with the amount of noise that's been going on lately, which again, maybe to the benefit and really not knocking those Rockwell guys because it probably is steering the dialogue towards maybe something you could argue is a bit more practical than action and mm-hmm. things, which is maybe now the industry is going to look towards um, you know, getting their knives ground really thin behind the edge, or maybe they're going to look towards having really comfortable handles or whatever it is, But um, or maybe they're going to look at, yeah, really getting the most out of their steel performance. The industry will respond with what we all talk about the most. Like, every, like any business that's, you know, got common sense, they'll be having their ear to the interwebs and seeing what we're all talking about. And it's no surprise that to back then, I think, what was it, the Kaiser started making really flash knives, and then you get Wii mm-hmm. knives come out, and they just took the world by storm, all the... Yep. online world by storm a bit that you could get this you know action that was comparable to something that you'd have to pay a thousand dollars for just a year before so it was definitely a response to that i think and but then you look at that actual knife and yeah right now it does nothing for me because it doesn't have what i like and i, I think i'm just at a fortunate point in time where what i like in a knife is what's maybe becoming what everyone else likes as well which is good so it's like it's like when you like say if you like wearing a denim jacket all the time and then eventually you get like every 20 years being wearing a denim jacket actually becomes fashionable again. I think, yes, I, think yes, yes, yes. I think my moment's about That's to come, funny. you know. So it's, I think yeah. it's about to – the industry might start to think because, I mean, I've got that, that TRM Adam. It's not on me now, but it's up in my room. And that knife is just impeccably ground, right? It's just ground Beautiful. so thin and it's just an amazing little cutter and it's, it's flat ground and it's – They've just done a proper flat grind where they've got it really thin behind the edge. And I, I would wonder if they hadn't been listening to everyone talking about how they want their knives to cut for a long time or slice really well, maybe that knife wouldn't have been like that. I don't know what data they used to, to steer their, you know, this is how we're making a knife decision. But you wonder if that's, you know, even that sort of thing's not linked. Because um, if that's a sign of where it's going, then it's, it's 
absolutely great. Um, I mean, not that it hasn't always. There's always been knives that sliced amazing. Like I've mm-hmm. the Buck One Ten in the kitchen there, and it's probably, oh, yeah. probably one of the best. It's a Buck One Ten, but you can't say that it doesn't slice really well. So maybe they're just going to revisit that. Or yeah, I'm not sure, but um, yeah, you but, can also throw it overboard and mm, keep your boat in place. Yeah, yeah. And so that's the thing. If it, and not, like most things, it's a pendulum. So who knows? In about a year's time, we might all have like amazing slicing knives, but with the action is like a you know rusty old you know box of bolts so you never know sometimes it swings too far the other way but um yeah i think the best tech tersel back in that day was people and remember what we were, what else were we playing with in 2013 bloody fidget spinners they were that that was oh, the geez. you know it was peak fidget spinner time I, if i remember <laughs> correctly it was about then and you know so it's really the knife just reminds me of that point in time in the community where we're all playing with spinning tops and fidget spinners as well as knives. And so, what do you get when you make a knife? Of course, a knife that has amazing action, looks really elegantly machined, but uh, maybe isn't so great at being a knife. So, it's um, yeah, it was that was really interesting to handle. And, I, you know, I almost didn't publish that review because I was thinking, you know what? When something doesn't connect with me, I'm always a bit like, is it really worth me doing a hit piece on this knife? But yeah, it was an interesting thing to bring up, I suppose. So I'm kind of yeah. glad I did. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't feel like you were necessarily uh, dissing on Best Tech or anything like that. I, I felt more like you were making a comment on how the industry has, you know, has developed and and i feel like right now there are more knife people than ever before hmm. and uh so maybe uh you know in the early 2000s the late 90s uh it, it was it was all you know mostly in the hands of of a few collectors and then a bunch of law enforcement and military guys hmm. and then as uh, and, and so all all the um overbuilt knives and stuff are made for for that group as it was bleeding into the collectors, yeah. and now, now it's people who love the thingness of it. I mean, that's yeah. I, I love the look, the feel to play with, to use knives, and I think there are a lot of people. It's more acceptable than guns, you know. So I think, mm. or 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 other associated hobbies, you know, those mm. have kind of always been, you know, stepsisters or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I just feel like now that now that your average office guy might just might have a pocket knife, especially if they work in my office. I end yep. up giving everybody a knife, but um, you know. So tastes have changed. Yeah, for sure. I always say one of the big things the knife community missed, like, well, the, not the knife community, but knife man- manufacturers missed, was they had this. And I know that we dis this. We, we hipsters are a, hipsters are something you make fun of, right? You know, it's it's, it's common. They're, they're easy sport to tease hipsters. I'm a bit. Sure. Of, I'm a bit of a bloody hipster myself. I'd, you know, I'd probably I'd probably fit that label a little bit. But the industry missed that. You had a few little brands. You had the James brand. You had a few little brands trying to make those total hips fashionable brand, knives. Yeah. yeah, but they were too. It's it's too little, too late. They've. It was about mm. a year late that they decided to start making modern slip joints and things like that that the hipsters were actually looking for. Like if someone in 2014, when that movement was at its strongest, if someone had made a a knife that looked like a grandpa knife that would have looked good in, you know, a an Abercrombie and Fitch catalog. If Benchmade or if Cold Steel or if Spyker, oh, that Lion Steel, you were just playing with it. Yeah, yeah, you know, it, all the stuff they they missed it. It's too late. They could have got so many more knives and so many more hands if they'd properly, you know, if they'd probably not listened to, because there would have been voices in the community. Stop making hipster knives, hipster garbage, all that sort of stuff. These companies just would have made big dollars, which then they could have reinvested into making knives that the rest of us love if they'd just kind of been a little bit less. Uh, I don't know if they were scared. I don't even know if they're aware, to be honest. But if they'd been a little bit more um, willing to maybe make something that looked a little bit nerdier or looked a little bit more, um, you know, subdued or just a, maybe just looked yeah like a hipster knife. But if they'd made that at the right time, who knows how many more knife guys we could have got on board? Because I look at my own origins in knives. You know, what my first damn knife was that I bought is the Bear Grylls Ultimate Survival Knife. Ah, uh, yeah, you, I remember you know, that. and and. You know, now I've got a I've got a police four in my hand. I've got a native ch- uh, chef, native chief. That's where I started. So if we could have got a bunch of sort of dorky hipster dudes started off with some you know artisan looking pocket knives from Benchmade, maybe they'd just be amongst us again as cool new voices in the community. So I always regret that no one really, apart from some small micro brands, really jumped in on that because it could have been a way. And instead of back at the time, they were still pushing tactical, they were still pushing all that sort of stuff. And those markets are fine, but I think that they're saturated. There was mm-hmm. they they could have jumped in and done a little bit more with probably. You know, and who knows how long, you know, even if only half of those guys who bought, you know, say, let's let's imagine a knife. So, say Spyderco made the Spyderco Hip Boy, right? So, say back in 2014, only, you know, only half the guys who bought a Spyderco Hip Boy 
kept catering a knife. But that's still, you know, even if it's an extra 5,000 new knife enthusiasts, that magnifying effect over the next 10 years of sales they would have made, you know, yeah, some of them would have just put it down, never carried it, and decided knives weren't for them. But, yeah, it was a bit of a missed opportunity, in my opinion. I always thought that. It's nice to say it out loud because I've always thought it, but yeah. well, you you put words to it quite <laughs> nicely, sir. Yeah. What, so what do you what do you um I I, I got some more. Yeah. What 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 kind of uh, uses do you put your knives to? A and B. It's probably not tactical or self defense, but where do you come down on that side of things? Well, um, my home pocket knife use. I've got a box house over there that I made with my Spyderco police for my kids yesterday. It's made out of like several moving boxes. So it's kind of dad stuff at home. My job is actually in the tactical and in the, like I'm a first responder kind of guy. So I actually do you, I just, I don't speak about it in my reviews and stuff because I don't want to run off that economy of, you know, I don't want to portray myself as like a badass because I'm not, I'm yeah, just, yeah, yeah. I use my knives in a very rudimentary way at work, but I suppose it would qualify as hard use. Like I had a donkey that had got itself stuck in a whole bunch of just cable. It was just in a mess and it was in a fence that oh. was hanging off onto a road. And so I had to, I used my Falcon even F1 and I completely dulled the crap out of the edge of it. But I cut through all this, this garbage that was attached to this donkey just on the side of, on a roadside. So I do do a bit of that stuff at work, like the the stuff that I guess the companies would probably love to say, yes, this is what we make knives for. But um, right, right. yeah, I do do a little bit of that. Like it's um, it's just the whole thing. I don't really like to bring into my videos because I don't want my job sure. to start saying you're using your job as a way to you know become a fancy YouTuber and use your you know sure, use your sure. valor or whatever is. So I'm not, I'm not interested in that at all. But I do have quite varied organic knife use. Uh, I guess you could call it like the things that actually I do use a knife for from the dad stuff to the little bit more intense stuff. I like, I'm not a, I'm not a fireman clearing and I'm not a SWAT team guy clearing rooms or anything like that. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, I still use them relatively robustly. But, um, then again, most of my, like when I do a review, the most telling thing for it is probably my rope cut test because that does so much for showing the ergonomics of a knife, which is just as important, if not more than the blade itself. Sometimes a knife seems amazing in my hands, and then I do a rope cut test with it, and it's just not as fun. Like, the paramilitary 2 is a great example of that. Like, it seems like such an ergonomic handle. But when I do that repetitive, non-stop push, you know, draw cut that I do on that rope, um, after a couple of hundred goes, it's not the nicest place to be, having your hand wrapped around a, a paramilitary 2. And it's interesting, that dimension that gives it as well. But, um, yeah, my average knife use is probably just like everyone else's. No more glamorous or anything than anyone else's, really. Box houses... Um, opening cat food, dog food. I always have, I do that thing and it grosses my wife out, but you know, sometimes the the kitchen knives are just in an awkward spot. They're maybe at the back of the dishwasher or whatever. So I'm not above maybe using my, I got my police out last night and I cut up some salami with it. And I can just see like wife will walk past and just stare at me and just like, you know, we've got kitchen knives. Yeah, so I get the look, of course, but you know I'm not above doing that as well. And it, you know, it's um, it's sometimes you, you might be in the fridge and you need to just quickly open something while the fridge door's still open. You want to get it cl closed before it starts beeping at you. So I'll just whip out whatever I've got in my pocket and use that for that as well. So yeah, pretty baby, very... baby, it's food safe. That's yeah, what I say. Exactly. It's food safe, exactly. baby. I and clean this. I use my um, my EDCI or whatever that stuff's called. So you keep it nice and yeah. clean. But um, yeah. What are your ideal properties in a in a carry knife in a carry uh? pocket knife I, I think i know what they are er ergonomics and yeah. good steel and I've thinly never been, ground blade yeah. but i've never been fussed about locks i don't care how it locks up i mean i like it to have a strong ish lock or at least a lock where if because i mean a good example is the cardboard um if you use a swiss army knife cutting cardboard sometimes you do you, you you're clumsy you, you pull back a bit and the knife because it's a slip joint will close so i want something that's going to be stronger than that and that's about mm -hmm. my lock needs met really mm -hmm. um I mean, if it was something for work, I'd, I mean, I'm probably just using, a, I'm using a fixed blade at work anyway, so it's not really, I'm not after a huge lock in any sense, in any real field that I'm using my knives. Um, so yeah, don't mind about the locks. I just like simplicity, really. Like my favorite elements of knife design are things like Almar, things like simple Spydercos, uh, knives that kind of just look like folding steak knives is probably my favorite mm -hmm. look of a knife. I mean, you look at my knives on the table, I've got the Spyderco Police, the Native Chief, and I like these a lot. Like they're just black G10 yeah. handles, just nice and indiscriminate. I love the native chief. Yeah, it's really, it seems really nice. I've only just got it. Nick's sent it over to me to play with. I'm terrified of breaking the tip. I'm yeah, right. you know, it is quite delicate there, isn't it? And I'll, I'll be doing a comparison with the Police 4 because you see there, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Do, do these yeah, two knives really the need to exist? <laughs> it's funny, isn't <laughs> yeah, it? They're, right. they're so, they, there's a lot going on in both of these. I mean, there's just, there's a steel difference and a liner difference, but. 
anyway, that's the story to follow, I guess. But yeah, um, I like my knives to have simple handles. I was talking about that best tech again, that those complicated handles that are supposed to fit your fingers exactly into grooves never work for me. I, never, I don't care about bearings um, or washers, really. Washers are I think I'd prefer washers if someone made me choose, but it would never be something that stopped me from buying a knife. Um, I like to have a blade, probably three and a half inch is my happy spot for a blade. Don't mind smaller, I don't mind a little bit larger. Um, but yeah, mainly just I'm a bit of a edge performance guy, so I suppose Spyderco does okay. I wouldn't li- I wouldn't mind even if Spyderco went a bit thinner because my EDC knives I do use for quite light tasks. Only thin edges aren't great if you're you know doing you know. Uh, demolition type jobs and stuff but for me i'd like thin edges um i like i think i've been steering towards preferring hollow grinds lately over flat but yeah. um again as long as it cuts okay like i've had a few knives that have come and have just been really disappointed and that, that i've had to actually completely almost reprofile out of the box to get it where i like it but then maybe that's just me being too fussy as well it's like i say a lot like uh, say zero tolerance will sell you a knife with quite a thick edge and i think that goes in line mm-hmm. with their hard use philosophy and all that sort of stuff and that's fine but every time I get one I'm just not quite happy until I've thinned it back to 17 degrees per side and then it does what I like it to do but whether I should force my own wants onto every company is probably completely wrong. I think you're completely justified. Yeah, I don't know. Mainly performance is where I'm going lately. Um, I don't, yeah. I'm not adverse to having just a fun knife to flick but I always just prefer that to be a, a sub feature of a knife that's that's cutting well and is a joy to sort of everyone likes when you can just slice through something in a nice long continuous cut that's yeah. that's the feeling for me it's like when you got the scissors going and you just have to push and you don't have to snip anymore like yes. everyone yes. loves that feeling and thin well ground knives and good steels seem to tick that little i don't know if it's asmr or whatever it is they seem to stroke that little <laughs> part of my brain pretty well so that's generally what i'll shop for like that's what gets me excited when i see a new knife coming out if it's if it looks like it's going to slice well if it's got a nice neutral handle then that's probably the knife for me. And it leaves me with a lot of quite boring looking knives, but um, you find your differences in them and you fuss over them in your own way and you, you see them all as your, your own little knives, don't you, in the end? Yep, yep. Well, they become a part of the family until yeah, you sell right. them off. I did a video, like I've got like my unsellables, like my little permanent collection, but that is quite hard to get into. But when I look at that, with the exception of the Buck Marksman, which is just like the freak mutant stepbrother of them all, um, <laughs> it's they're all quite basic um, looking knives, very simple sort of. So, yeah, once it's in that, it's pretty safe. But um, yeah, otherwise, I'm pretty ruthless as well, so to speak, with getting rid of stuff that's not absolutely connected with me. Gosh, I, I admire that. I do. I I, uh, I like to think I'm not a materialist, uh, but I have a really hard time getting rid of knives. And then I finally get up the gumption to do it. You know, I, I uh, spoke to uh, Austin over at the Epic Snuggle Bunny mm. recently, and he's on this reduce and refine kick. Yeah, like, he is yeah, reduce and refine. Yeah, so, so should I. And uh, and and I and I'll go <laughs> I'll go into my knife case and I'll stand the ones up that I, I think I can part with. On the edge. Yeah. And then, and then when I'm away from them, I'm like, oh, I could totally get rid of that. And then I come home and I open it up and I start playing with it. And I'm like, yeah, but it feels so good in hand. Mm-hmm. And then I have a hard time. So I, I, I worry that I'm becoming a bit of a material list with this i'm not a curator of a museum i don't need to represent every lock type and every steel type yeah, and every that's you know. a temptation as well isn't it getting you wanting mm-hmm. to have one of everything and yeah well this police here like my police for this was one of the few i've had two or three that i have sold and had that instant regret and had to buy back so the police four was one of those um i don't know why i sold it um i think I just saw something else and I was like, and I needed to raise money fast because as you <laughs> yep. get, you get that temporary insanity. So the police <laughs> four, I'm glad to have back and this will stay. I think I'm relatively sure. Last one was the American lawman. That's a wonderful knife from cold steel. Um, and I'd sold mine and I felt silly straight away. And the next one that I need to get back is it's a fixed blade from Lion steel called the T five. And that's a wonderful fixed blade knife. And I, um, I again sold it in a moment of idiocy and, um, I'll I'll get that back as well, but that, apart from that, I'm relatively regret free with my little little sort of reduce and refine Austin Snuggle Bunny type ethos. So doing pretty well, I think. So uh, where where do you see the future of the industry going? You you mentioned before you, you might not be sure, but what's the next obsession going to be? Do you think? Next obsession, well, I think this steel stuff's going to be hard to ignore. It's going to result in two things: either the companies not ever talking about Rockwell or hardness mm. again ever. So it's going to be either that or – and that – you know what? I, I wouldn't be surprised if half did that and the other half really pandered to it and became like 
this is our this this is our you know M390 at 64 Rockwell. It's and they'll be really performance, performance, performance. And so I could wouldn't be surprised if the industry split a little bit uh, into those two schools of thought, or if yeah, one or the other took over. So I think that's probably what's going to be. Uh, next on the radar for a lot of folks. But then I'm aware, I don't know US politics at all, but I'm aware there's some stuff with your market changes and stuff is there with mm-hmm. how um, economical it might be to do business if you're drop shipping from China. I'm not sure if there's taxes or something that's changing. So that may have an effect as well. Yeah. Is that like to the point Tar- where- Tariffs and such. Yeah, tariffs. Because it can always be something completely random like that. All of a sudden, maybe We Knives and Best Tech Knives will be an extra $70 each and that'll just- you know, and that'll give the range back to cold yes. steel. Or ben- you just never know. So it could be something that's dictated by our trends, or it could just be something that's dictated by some bureaucrat signing something somewhere. And um, yeah, all of a sudden, some steel's in short supply, or or all of a sudden, it's more expensive to send S thirty five VN to China and get it back than just to make the knives here and 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 make the whole thing here. So you just never know. Or, or an American company like Spyderco, who does a lot of manufacturing in China, yeah. having tariffs on the on the mm. tenacious once mm. a cheap knife coming down at you know 150 bucks now exactly. or something. So they like need that. to either evolve it and put a slightly an better steel they can source over there into it, or, or they need to yeah just make it here or stop making it. It was really interesting to see. Um, Nick went and saw Gerber. Did you see Nick Shabazz went and saw Gerber? Yeah, I, I saw that, but I didn't see the video. Yeah, I haven't watched it's it. It's a good. He the, what he said. The Gerber obviously they seem like they're at that crossroads too. Where I what I would say is they're probably getting some. They'd be feeling it. Gerber do a lot of. Um, they use like just their pretty mid range American steels, and they seem to be doing a lot of stuff in their American factory now. And they're really going mm-hmm. for that whole. We're getting back to American production, and that yep. must be whether they smell something on the wind coming. But there'd be an element of that, I think, there. Um, because that really seems like they're trying to weigh in and say, you know, what we can be. Why, you know, why do we have to be embarrassing Gerber? We could be cool Gerber. We could be. We could right. swing with zero tolerance and golden Colorado Spyderco. You know, it seems like that's what they're trying to do. Whether or not they'll do it, I have no idea. Well, they they did. They used to be. Yeah. My dad had an awesome sort of uh, something competing with the 110 anyway, a mm. lockback uh, in the 70s. That yeah, was yeah. it was awesome. Yep. And just prestigious, they they used to have it. It's, I mean, it's just, I mean, everyone knows the Gerber story, I suppose, by now. But mm-hmm. I just wonder if they wouldn't be better off just because you know, you, I saw it was it was a really interesting day, right? I saw that video of Nick and it's Gerber saying, you know, we're, oh, we, you know, we're they're trying to sort of say we're legitimate again. We're we're making these amazing American knives and with the fastballs, just the start of things, yep. which is great. And then the next video below it was um, Gideon's Tactical reviewing this. Gerber orange handled machete thing that's made of three CR13 MOV in China. And I'm just like, that's, that's Gerber's problem in a single image is this. They've got these two things they're saying. So they just need to say, you know what? The Chinese knives, they're not Gerber knives anymore. They're Fiskars knives. That's what they need yes. to do and say in Gerber, if you have a Gerber knife, it's made in America and it's, whether it's good or not is up to, you know, everyone to figure out, but it's going to be, it's got integrity. If it's the, if it's got Gerber on it, we're back to having integrity. And that's what the Gerber needs to do because it's every, every stride forward they take with something cool like the fastball, then you get all these reviewers who show off these like machetes that snap at the handle and <laughs> it's, it, it's, yeah. and people don't have the time to, put as much thought into it as maybe knife nerds do. But yeah, people who make sort of more broad assumptions are just going to say, yeah, well, I saw that one good Gerber knife, but then there was that video from two years ago of someone breaking that Bear Grylls Gerber parang on the, you know, it's, yeah, that's a funny thing. But I think Gerber are probably aware of whatever's cooking with the, the tariff side of the industry. And I think that might be also why they're, making this push for you know, better local production too. So back to the original question, I think that is probably something that's going to impact a little bit just as much as our, you know, knife nerd thoughts on what we like. So, but in terms of if, if knife nerd thoughts are what's steering it, then yes, I think it'll be performance blades, thin behind the edge. That's sort of stuff. Um, all the terms that us reviewers start parroting because God, we do some, we do some group think us reviewers. I really, tr- <laughs> I really try and separate myself from it, but I tell you what, I find my, I catch myself saying these same things and it's, um, it's funny. Like I, I did a video a while back where I was, because I, I used to always just say, and I because I got on with the nothing fancy train, nothing fancy like the yeah. you know, the father of gear reviews. Spyderco started doing flat ground knives, and nothing fancy puts in his videos. Flat grind is the best grind; it slices the best. FFG baby, yeah, FFG <laughs> man, and um, you know it's um, it when I've actually sort of cut knife first knife, hollow grind beats it for ninety percent of the stuff, and the other stuff it just kind of matches it. It's one of those things. Um, yeah, there's going to be a little bit more. 
uh, emphasis on I think um, us actually you know seeking this performance from our blades so just a little bit. I hope I hope so anyway. Do you think that these uh, companies are too responsive? Do you think they're too responsive to fans and YouTubers? Oh, it's funny, isn't it? Because in one hand, I'm thinking they weren't responsive enough jumping on the hipster train that I was talking about before. But then in another, maybe it isn't best to snap to a decision when, you know, just two or three really vocal people on the internet have a problem as well. So, or have a suggestion. I don't know. I think it's always going to be about six months after, given how fast you can make things and design things and all that sort of stuff. So I think if we all decided tomorrow that we all want really thin blades, I think in about a year's time at Shot Show Blade Show 2020, we'd all start seeing these really thin blades. Uh, maybe. I mean, there's certainly an element of stubbornness in companies as well. They're they're also run by humans who have their own, you know, and often they're run by you know more senior humans who would probably think, well, hmm. I always like knives like this, so stuff it. I'm still yeah. making these knives, but um, these are what we know how to make. Yeah, exactly. So there's always going to be that element as well but i think it's going to be reactive enough and it'll be just father capitalism it'll it'll whoever's quick enough and gets in on the trend quick enough will make their money and whoever's not won't and um yeah i just think that with regard to like when problems arise i think i i never have any um anything but sympathy for like just the poor people on the coal face for the companies when like pr- issues happen because we're also we're also quick to just like insta shame if you get a sh- if you have a slightly <laughs> awkward dealing with some customer service rep people will just post the conversation now and I know this because I was a dick and I did that with Steel Will and I just felt like such an asshole after it and yeah you know, people are in my ear saying no you're right that was fine to do it but it didn't change the fact of how I actually felt doing it and I right, just felt right. like a complete turd just being like you know with this poor chick she's just trying to deal with me as a customer and uh you know so it's that whole element of it that i'm i don't quite know what the answer is to it because you don't want to silence people people should be able to say what their experiences are for sure but all i can say is and again back to what i was saying before just remember there's humans at every step of this knife supply and also knife use chain as much as the customers are human so are the so is you know uh, Instagram lady who's just answering the questions as well. So, right. Yeah. Well, it's like, you know, cancel culture. Is it really going to come to the knife world? Come on, people. Oh, Let's, no. it's not, it's not, well, it's not worth it. They, they haven't canceled Benchmade yet, have they? And I mean, Benchmade yeah, probably right. still, they, they, as far as I'm aware, Benchmade set up the NRA convention or the, the NRA gun show, whatever it was a mm-hmm. few months ago. And I wasn't aware of any fire bombings that happened or wasn't aware of the, the guy getting caught out. And so I think a lot of it is just internet talk from people who just yeah. like internet drama. And yeah. without getting too broad, I think that's just a massive problem with the world in general these days. Just a real small vocal minority, just, just making it their business to be on Twitter just bigging things up and and i mean just in another thing is just the amount of like fake fans and you know you can you can buy followers from a follower house now and so if you get it you can buy yourself fifty thousand followers on instagram and then of course if you go and say something to say you have then you have a problem with a gerber knife and you've got fifty thousand followers gerber might look at it and you go holy shit this guy's a right. big swinging dick we got to listen to what he says so there's just so much to not trust on the internet as well as great as the internet is there's just so much to be cautious of as well like it's it's a it's a full-on thing and um i just i don't know what the answer is to that but yeah there's just this yeah the cancel culture i think the knife industry is pretty resilient to it because it's just there's just lots of established institutions and nothing's ever going to be life or death that comes up even the worst drama <laughs> isn't going to be unless it finds out that you know cold steel's like you know building nuclear weapons and selling them to like Turkmenistan or something like <laughs> maybe that but really it's it's a pretty resilient pretty rooted in tradition industry that I think will be relatively immune to that because like as a sub interest of mine being a YouTuber I'm just interested in YouTube as well and YouTube at the moment is just toxic with the big YouTubers taking each other down and and um, sharing each other's dms and trying to expose each other for that's like a real economy on youtube at the minute and it's like mm. and i just look at that and i think well this is half of my hobby just because I, I just enjoy outside of knives i just enjoy lots of youtubers yeah other ones yeah. and i'm yeah. just like man i would hate for this to leak into like my other part of my hobby because this is just intense it's, it's like a real it's a real odd way to spend your free time just being so <laughs> angry like it's like <laughs> You know, you, you, you can go to your work and be angry because your boss sucks. So you can, you know, you can, your kids can give you a hard time. You can be angry at that. But when you, when the chips are down and you're just sitting at your computer, why aren't you looking at stuff that's making you happy? So I, I don't know. Thank you. Exactly. I, I think we're relatively immune. I, I, I would love to see, and no one's ever going to tell you, but I'd love to see if Benchmade sales were actually affected by the sort of the cancel sort of effort on them. I'd love to see it. But I mean, they'd say no. I'm sure most people would say no, but maybe they were slightly. Again, it was really interesting. I, um, 
Rob's video the other day, which I don't really – back to that. I don't really have an opinion of it. It's just – it's his opinion, which he's sharing, and that's fine. But um, you, know, you see all the comments when the comments were up, you know, unsubscribed, I'm, I'm off, this is it, done. <laughs> and then, and then, then I looked at Rob's social blade, and he'd lost three subscribers that day. Like it's – you oh know, my so God, it's, uh, there's just so funny. much noise. That's um, hilarious. And then when it actually comes to – the problem with the internet is that measurable numbers are really hard to find. So, um, yeah, I, it's funny. I yeah. As loud as people can seem like they're being, it is. We just need to remember it is still often just someone at home just trying to whip up a, a Twitter frenzy or whip up a comment frenzy as well. So, as with everything, the real decisions are going to be made. People voting with their wallets or proper, large, wide scale, you know, grassroots change is all that's going to really make an effect, I think, on the knife industry. Not that it particularly needs to change. I think it's ticking along just nicely as it is. Well, what about uh, your knife? hobby slash obsession what do you see as the future of your knife thing i mean i've got my grails obviously i need to do a video testing a rockstead knife um there's a there's a fella called um sean and he does the big brown bear channel and triple b handmade knives and he is on the apex of finding so he'll get rex 121 he will Mm -hmm. heat treat it to 70 and then he'll put it in a knife that's like 0.01 microns behind the edge like you have a couple of his knives right the, the little fixed blades no no those are other those are other small makers sean's okay. a sean i'd need to save up about you know i'd need to save up a half a week's paycheck to get what i want from sean um I got you. but yeah that's on my list as well i want to i want to experience the pinnacle of performance because right now very unsatisfyingly to me it's a um i mean rex is the rex 121 knife that i've had was great but the thing at the top of my bloody knife lab results for whatever they're worth is a sandrin tungsten carbide knife and it's like one of these have you seen the sandrin tck no it's a cool little thing but it's kind of not really a knife as much as like all my other knives are knives it's like a little it's a piece of tungsten carbide that's at 72 rockwell like it's a really hard little piece Whoa. it's amazing it cut more than anything else until i got a professional sharpener to sharpen my rex 121 with a proper fancy edge um mm. then th- then it just matched it as, which was the most annoying thing in the world because uh, I stop I stop in increments on my cuts, right? And I um, I, I was just like, oh, well, this is what the TCK cuts. So I'll just test if it's still going now. And it stopped right there. And I, was, I would have Aww. loved to have had, as stupid as this is, I would have loved to have had steel win, you know, like over, because tungsten carbide is not a traditional knife blade material. Right, <laughs> so right. I was like, maybe steel can take this back. So anyway, so I'd love to experience the ultimate in what you can do with the steel. And I've got no doubt that it's going to be from Sean or from a maker like him that's properly performance focused. So that's, that's where I want to go. So it probably does involve spending a little bit more money or just a couple of large sums. But that's my mm-hmm. ambitions for probably the next six months to a year is to get something from Rockstead just to see if that's all hype. I see their rope cutting tests. I'm like, they do very well, but they kind of push cut. I want to see if my cuts are a bit different. Mm-hmm. All the nerdy minutiae in my head are ticking over just watching Rockstead go. So there's that. I think um, I do need to take a rest from my uh, edge retention because I actually have a really sore shoulder, like consistently sore shoulder lately from no doing kidding. it. So I, I'm having a rest from doing Repetitive it. Repetitive stress. Yeah, really. So yeah. I am having a, a bit of a break from doing that because um, I just hate to like have a long going and ongoing issue from it i feel so stupid so uh, I'm, I'm having a bit of a break so i'm sort of focusing probably a bit more in the future on um and i'll still do cutting tests on my reviews but i'm probably just gonna be focusing on just reviews and um i've got to get out and do one of my overnighters again people just ask as soon as i finish and publish one they're asking when the next one's going to be my um dickhead survival thing i go away and i was gonna do it last night but my daughter got sick and i didn't get to go and i was a bit like uh and, I th- and then i thought it's gonna be really interesting i'd be on this podcast having probably been awake all night sleeping in a ditch and i'd be really worse for me <laughs> so i was it was probably for the best it didn't happen last night but so i'll be just doing some other kind of um stuff that people have been asking me to do for ages i got really held i got really caught up on edge retention lately because i got this amazing box of spyderco mules obviously that i was working my mm. way through so, yeah, next six months to a year, probably next six months, just more, um, just basic knife stuff, just creative projects on my channel. And then in six months to a year, I'll probably ramp up the testing in and do some more sort of fun stuff, and more exotic steals and that sort of thing. But that's probably where I'm, where I'm looking to head. Well, okay, before we wrap, I would like to, uh, I'd like to do a little speed round with you. Yep. Uh, it's some questions and it's one or the other. Okay, cool. Okay. So, fixed or folder? Folder. Flipper or thumb stud? Thumb stud. Washers or bearings? Washers. Tip up or tip down? Tip up. Tanto or Bowie? Tanto. Hollow ground or flat ground? 
Hollow. Full size or small? Full size. Gentleman's knife or tactical knife? Tactical. Automatic or bally song? Ugh, neither. Um, it might be a moot point. Yeah, <laughs> it really is for me. I, neither, I can't get either of them, and neither right. of them appeal to me that much. Anyway, on to the questions. Uh, ZT or we? ZT. Benchmade or Spyderco? Spyderco. Milled titanium or spring clip? Spring clip. Carbon fiber or micarta? Micarta. Finger choil or no finger choil? No finger choil. Form or function? Function. Okay, and finally, your desert island knife. You have one knife for the rest of your life. It doesn't have to be on a desert island, but one knife for the rest of your life. Probably my... Got an Alex Stron fixed blade uh, in Nitro V still. It's on my channel. Been on my channel a few times. Great little four-inch fixed blade. It's just wonderful. So it's that one. What's it called again? I got to look it's, that up. The maker is Alex Stron, AD Knives, on Instagram. Oh, um, oh, okay. And it is probably the finest little fixed blade I've had. It's just excellent. Yeah. Yeah, he's a custom maker. Um, and I know it's, I always find those like unsatisfying answers because you want people to sort of like, oh, I have that knife or whatever. Or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's one other thing I, when I do reviews, I love to be able to review stuff that people can just look up and go and buy. So, I mean, yeah. if I was choosing something that wasn't that, I'd probably go like a Spyderco Caribbean, like that folding knife from Spyderco with the LC200 and steel. Something like yeah. that, but yeah, my 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 AD knife is probably my favorite knife. Well, Pete of Cedric and Ada Outdoors, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. I had a really fun time talking with you, and uh, uh, you know, I, I think you're doing great things for the YouTube knife world in that you're making really entertaining and fun videos. But there's also a serious side to it. To me, I think you've amassed a, a nice body of work. It might be what you call bro science or anecdotal, but what else do we have but anecdotal experience in our in our actual lives? So I applaud you. I love your videos. And it was a real pleasure talking to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, could I just do a quick shout out? If someone's after, Most definitely. If, if someone was listening and wanting more um, scientific figures and just mm -hmm. wanting to, uh, if you want proper knife science, knifestillnerds.com. Laren Thomas, check out his- He was a guest on our show. Yeah, here. so check out Laren's work because he actually has the- He's someone worth set, worth worth sort of um, hanging your, your coat to. So he's yeah he's he's who I him and Sean at, at um, Big Brown Bear they're, they're the people that I ask if if I need to know about a steel. So that's where you look for your proper science. For me, just enjoy my videos, um, use them for what they're worth, but don't get too stressy about it. But yeah, look at Laren, look to Sean if you want proper edge nerds. They're the ones to to chase up. Cool. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. He talks circles around me. <laughs> yeah, he does, and he does. It's cerebral stuff, but it's yep. if you're really interested, you'll love it. All right, thanks, Pete. Cool, man. Uh, All good. Thanks for coming on the show. We'll talk right, to you thanks, soon. Thanks, Bob. See you, man. Visit The Knife Junkie online at thenifejunkie.com. We're back on episode number 42 of The Knife Junkie podcast. And, Bob, before we get into uh, hearing your takeaways about our interview today, I want to remind you that one of our sponsors for The Knife Junkie podcast is Audible. If you like listening to podcasts like this, uh, other audio content, audio books, well, you can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial simply by going to audibletrial.com slash knife junkie. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, even your MP3 player. Again, audibletrial.com slash the knife junkie. Bob, another great interview. They just keep coming and getting bigger and better all the time every week. Uh, your your takeaways, your thoughts from your conversation with Pete. Well, first of all, when you say bigger, I start thinking I'm, <laughs> maybe I'm starting to blab a little too much. <laughs> no, no, that uh, would be that would be longer, not bigger. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, I mean, great conversation. I was so happy to to meet him at last. I. I I feel like uh, I know him just because I've watched his videos for so long. And, mm -hmm. and you know, you kind of feel like you get to know someone. So I felt like uh, it was just really great to to get to know him. And something that, uh, uh, an attitude that was reinforced in me is like, just remember, this is just a hobby. And we start to get, to, you know, it's good to take your hobbies seriously. It's good to really immerse yourself in, in whatever your, your interests and activities are. But, mm -hmm. you know, remember that uh, steel steel types and you know steel performance and and that kind of thing it's it, it is kind of relative to what you're going to actually be using it for so hmm. you know let's not take it that seriously but let's really enjoy the hobby and i, I feel like pete and uh you know remember uh, uh advanced knife bro people people like that really add some levity to the whole pursuit of collecting knives and it's you know some people really take it 
awfully seriously and get mm-hmm. in arguments and stuff like that. And, and guys like Pete really sort of bring the tone of the conversation back where it belongs. Mm. Well, interesting. Uh, if Ask our listeners, what, what was your takeaway from the interview? What do you think? Uh, you know, do you, do you kind of agree with Bob's uh, levity part and bringing the conversation back down, uh, jovial nature, that kind of thing? We, we'd love for you to give us a call on the listener line at 724-466-4487. 724-466-4487. Please leave us a comment. What'd you like? What you don't like? Your thoughts on today's interview or past show or whatever. Um, we'd love to uh, love to hear from you. And if possible, uh, you know, you'd like to uh, leave a comment. We'd love to uh, play it on the show and let uh, other folks uh, hear what you're thinking. And if yeah. you want to plug your website or product or whatever. Glad for you to do that as well. So, listener line, 724-466-4487. And just remember, there's no such thing as long distance anymore, so pick up the phone, give us a call. Just like your conversation with Pete shows, he wasn't right around the corner from you. That's right. Not for nothing, people. Uh, <laughs> when when we connected with uh, Pete in Australia, it was 1030 his time, 9 o'clock uh, in the evening, our time. Mm. And uh, we pressed the go button, and it was like he was next door. It was yeah. amazing. Actually, the connection to Australia was better than the connection to other places in the States. <laughs> That's true. So That's it was true. pretty bizarre. Yeah, and special thanks to him. I think he was actually on vacation that Indeed. week, right? So yep. uh, thanks, Tim, for, for taking the time out. Yeah, thanks, Pete. For Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco, uh, thanks for your interview, Bob. Uh, Thanks for everybody listening. For Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim Person. I want to thank you for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.